Good afternoon. This is Dr. Kenneth Ellenbogen, and I have the privilege today to talk with Dr. Sanjay Call. Dr. Call is the director of the Cardiovascular Disease Training Program at Cedars Sinai. He is a professor of medicine at the UCLA School of Medicine and at Cedars Sinai. And today we're here today to talk to Dr. Call and to learn from him about a very important paper that he published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. This paper was a meta-analysis of dronadarone comparing it to amiodarone. And in this paper, Dr. Call looked at the clinical outcomes of patients treated with dronadarone versus amiodarone in terms of the benefits and risks of these two medications. Dr. Call, can you tell us a little bit about the methods you used uh, to analyze this question? Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Alan Bogan. Uh, thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, we li looked at uh, two different endpoints. Uh, we looked at the antiarrhythmic efficacy of uh, dronadarone compared to placebo. And there have been about uh, less than half a dozen trials that have looked at this. And uh, what we found was that dronadarone was twice as effective uh, as placebo in uh, maintaining sinus rhythm in patients with non-permanent atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation. And we also analyzed, uh, at that time, the study was not published, but had been presented at several meetings, including at the FDA advisory panel, a study that directly compared dronadarone versus amiodarone called Dionysus. And uh, the major primary results in the Dionysus were that uh, dronadarone was half as effective as amiodarone in um, uh, uh, suppressing recurrence of atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. So that's, that was the one uh, part of our study. We also analyzed uh, outcome trials with dronadarone, and there have been two major outcome trials. The first one was called Andromeda, where dronadarone was evaluated in high-risk patient populations, including patients with congestive heart failure. That study was prematurely terminated because uh, of a observation of increased mortality. And uh, the second trial that uh, we evaluated was the uh, Athena study, upon which dronadarone uh, was approved by the FDA for prevention of cardiovascular hospitalization in patients with current or hi history of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. And so the Athena study was a positive study, and the primary endpoint of uh, all-cause mortality and cardiovascular hospitalization was significantly reduced uh, with dronadarone therapy. Now, what about the toxicity of these two agents? You've talked a little bit about efficacy. How do they compare both in the short term and the long term? Well, uh, there's only been one small study, the Dionysus study, uh, and, and uh, with very short follow-up uh, that directly com evaluated uh, safety along with efficacy of dronadarone versus uh, imiodarone. And uh, dronadarone was given in 400 milligrams uh, twice daily dose versus imiodarone in 200 milligram daily dose after a month of loading dose with 600 milligrams. And, and in that uh, study, uh, the, um, the safety profile see, appeared to be uh, better with dronadarone, uh, about 20% uh, better than amiodarone, but it was not statistically significant. And it is conceivable that if uh, they had enrolled a larger uh, number of patients and followed the patients for a longer period of time, uh, the, the differences would have been statistically significant. And the safety profile advantage of uh, dronadarone was primarily related to thyroid dysfunction, uh, mostly hypothyroid uh, uh, disorder, and uh, also some neurologic uh, uh, and ECG signs of prolonged QT and bradycardia. So, there, so in the Dionysus study, um, dronadarone was half as effective as amiodarone, but appeared to have a superior safety pro profile. So for a clinician, how does this come together? And, what, and, and there are a couple 
considerations. One is many people have AFib. You're treating for five years, 10 years, 15 years. How would you put all this together in terms of what we know about these two agents and their relative efficacy and toxicities? Uh, just sort of an overview, maybe summarizing the important take-home points for the clinician. You know, in my opinion, given the modest uh, anti-arrhythmic efficacy of uh, dronetarone relative to the gold standard, which is imiodarone, and lack of a clear-cut safety advantage uh, that has been uh, not demonstrated in the, in the current uh, uh, trials, uh, and uh, the huge cost disadvantage, remember imiodarone is uh, generic, whereas uh, dronetarone costs nearly nine bucks uh, a day. <clears throat> Uh, it's hard to make a case for using uh, dronetarone as first-line therapy. Uh, of course, uh, as a clinician, um, uh, each uh, decision has to be individualized, and uh, patient preferences and clinical judgments certainly play an important role in, in, in uh, clinical decision-making. And I can see there are some patients uh, who may actually um, accept uh, an improved uh, short-term tolerability or reduced efficacy as an acceptable trade-off. And, and those would be the patients where I can envision dronetarone to be uh, 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 initiated <clears throat> in these types of patients. But typically what I would say is that if patients uh, respond to guideline recommended first line therapies, the class one uh, agents such as uh, uh, and acetylol or flecainide in, in the appropriate patients, and uh, but they have some uh, tolerability issues with agents, or uh, then I would certainly consider the use of dronetarone, uh, particularly a second line or a third line. But uh, I would not use dronetarone as first line in, in these patients, and I certainly wouldn't use dronetarone in high-risk patients such as those with uh, uh, class 4 heart failure or patients with uh, decompensated class 3 uh, heart failure. Well, I want to thank you very much for your overview of your paper. Um, it was very useful and very thoughtful. Thank you very much.